you very much for everyone for participating here with us uh, this afternoon, live from Dubai and all over the world, under the high patronage of His Royal Highness Prince Michel de Yugoslavie, my dear Chairman Sir Anthony Ritosa is very pleased to present the Ritosa Family Office virtual keynote panel number two. The panel theme of this afternoon is Unlocking Investment Opportunities in this current environment. With this, I would like to introduce you to our virtual keynote panel chairman that is no other than Marcus Lenner. Marcus is the principal of the Marcus Lenner Family Office, as well as a CEO of Lenner Investments. I would also like to introduce you to our wonderful panelists uh, this afternoon, starting with our dear friend Nouf Al-Hakbani, Al who is also the ambassador of our Riyadh conference. She is CEO of the Dar Bedaya Group in Saudi Arabia. Following that, uh, we have His Serene Highness Prince, Prince Erman Zulainigan. We have His Excellency Marwan Jazim Al Sarkal, who is the Executive Chairman of Sharjah Investment and Development Authority, Sharuk, in the UAE. Then we also have our dear friend Stergios Voskopoulos, who is the CEO of Canu Capital from the Kingdom of Bahrain. We have from Texas Michael W. Wright, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of W. Wright Drilling and and exploration in the in the USA, and finally, but not least, Sidney Wheatley, CEO of private office of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdullah bin Hamad Al Khalifa from the Kingdom of Bahrain. Dear Marcus, the platform is all yours, and just wanted to include that this virtual panel will be one hour long. We will have fifteen minutes. Uh, Q&A at the very end. Please share your questions in our chat group. And uh, Marcus, thank you so much for taking over now. Well, my pleasure, Vanessa. Good afternoon, uh, Sir Anthony. Good afternoon again, Vanessa and everyone um, with us around the world. Uh, best regards from Monaco. Back on the way to a new normality. And um, I'm really very honored and uh, pleased to be the chairman again today to this uh, Ridosa family office virtual keynote panel. It's also a new experience for me, not being the German, but uh, doing that on an online session. And I'm actually very excited. I hope you don't realize that. And I hope you don't see my, my shaking hands for that. It's really a, a new world. And um, I think that's the future, definitely. Um, first of all, um, I would like to ask uh, my dear friend, His Royal Highness Prince Michel, um, what will this new normality look like for your point of view, not only in Monaco where we both live, but uh, in general, how would that look like? Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here and participate with everyone. Uh, Marcus, uh, wonderful to see you, my friend. Um, it is, it's a, it's a buzzword, this new reality. Everybody is talking of new reality and nobody really knows what it means. Uh, we have been living, all of us, in our reality, which is different from every country, every city, every continent. Uh, one thing that I think everybody has realized is the amount of destruction that the human being does to the environment. Uh, in a way, it's... it's it's the way we are to, to, to grow, we have to destroy. Uh, it's a bit the same situation with businesses. You grow a business, you destroy another one, and then you think, and then you recreate yourself. And it's like a life circle. One thing I know talking to many people around is that everybody has been kind of traumatized by this confinement. It's something we are not used to. Uh, it goes against our principles of just being free, being able to do what we want, when we want, to meet some friends, to hug, to touch, uh, which is completely uh, put in, on froze right now. So we are all like frozen. 
and we're going to go out of the refrigerator and how we're going to unfreeze, I'm not sure what will happen. Uh, but I will be very happy to talk with you more during this uh, hour-long uh, seminar about the opportunities, at least what we think are the opportunities, uh, what businesses we think will disappear, and uh, how we will cope with all of this. I think uh, you're perfectly right, uh, and we, we don't know yet uh, which direction we are going. We hear so many information and news, and um, I think what, uh, what uh, concerns us today more than the, um, the health and medical impact is, of course, the economic impact. And um, it's going to be a big surprise, and uh, without judging, I think um, we're going to see a, a lot of opportunities. It's going to be um, good and bad. And um, we come later on back to you, Michel, if we may. And um, I would like now to come to Nuf. Um, even if we can't see her, uh, she is here, I'm certain. And I would like to ask you how the pandemic will reshape our life in the aftermath um, after COVID-19 and how responsible investors can respond to that. What would you think, Nuf? Thank you, Marcus. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ansar Anthony for his invitation. I'm very honored to be selected uh, to be part of such a prestigious uh, group. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 has uh, impacted our life and day-to-day uh, uh, -day, uh, activities, I see that it's uh, like a wake-up call for everyone, especially for uh, uh, government and family offices um, and you know it's the uh, the first and foremost human tragedy uh, tragedy affected the people across the globe so i think our response should be uh, uh, to re uh, allocate our our budget or our investment to more of uh, uh, you know climate friendly uh, low carbon society uh, 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 healthcare, uh, maybe uh, that could also be part of uh, government initiative since, you know, family offices are uh, holding a, a huge amount of, uh, of cash or amount of assets uh, that can be uh, used, uh, you know, to support government initiatives. Agreed. Also a subject we could speak about for a long time, I guess, but... Um... Uh, again, also to you, we'll come back a bit later on, but Nuf, really very, very good input. Thank you very much. And um, Herman, I would like to uh, say something before I ask you a question. Um, I think one of the reasons why, why I appreciate very much uh, doing these kind of things is because I've, I met so many interesting people over the last years with Anthony and everything you do. And at this point, really great. Thank you. This is uh, so much uh, value in my life. Uh, and one of them is Hermann. I met him because of us, because of our events, and I'm very pleased. And I may say that Hermann and myself, we are friends now as well. And uh, it's uh, thanks to you, Antonio, and thanks to what, what you do. So, Hermann, what have investors learned about market from past historic events? What would you think? Well, thank you. And uh, thank you as well, Anthony and, and Vanessa and Michelle and everyone in Marcus, that was very kind of you to uh, start with those kind words. And I would say the same. It's been a great pleasure to, uh, to spend time with you at these wonderful conferences that we've all enjoyed so much. It's interesting because, um, you know, markets um, have learned a lot in the past, but every event has been a bit different. And I think this time around, we are using words like historic and once in a lifetime and and never seen before and unprecedented. And, and they're probably the right words to use because this is something that um, many of us, perhaps all of us have never seen where a world literally stops with a, a healthcare crisis the way we've seen. But I will say that the market itself, which is kind of an interesting um, vehicle, um, watches carefully what's happening today, but as we all know, it seems to discount what's going on in the future. And I saw last week there was a screenshot of um, the amount of people that lost their jobs, 16 million. And on the same day, the markets had the biggest rally in, since 1930. So again, a market that was not so much paying attention to the sad events of today, but trying to figure out what's happening beyond the valley. And so we have learned that uh, markets discount the future. And, and very simply, we've always seen the value of a company um, as the combination of all those future earnings that this company is going to make 
and we discount them back to today. And, and we really believe that even though it's going to be a very difficult year, um, one blow up in earnings won't change what the value of a good sustainable business is or a good sustainable market. So really, um, we're not here to predict, but we want to prepare our clients and we're not going to tell you what will happen, but perhaps what can happen. And, and we have learned that markets have paid more attention to the long-term business potential um, and have, have really tried to overlook some of the, the short-term noise, as we call it. So volatility is something that we see a lot of. Um, volatility is not a bad thing. It means people are thinking about what's happening. We often say when there's no volatility, um, everyone's thinking the same and, and then no one's really thinking. So um, today we really believe that uh, the market is, um, is going to take care of those companies that, that care about um, building a good sustainable business and uh, paying more attention to what's going on maybe two, three, four years. And we've often said that we prefer use a lens, not trying to get the next hundred days right, but trying to get the next thousand days right. And that's really what we're trying to do today. Very right, Taman. Very right what you said. Maman, um, the UAE has issued a 27 billion stimulus package earlier this year. How has this supported its economy and businesses? So, Marcus, uh, very nice to see you, uh, Excellencies, uh, your, your Royal Highness, Prince, uh, Likewise. Michel, Prince uh, Herman, uh, Excellency Anthony, uh, and all of our dear friends joining us, part of this, uh, this session, but also around the globe, hearing us, it's a great honor of, uh, of being here, sharing our knowledge. Uh, telling the world uh, how business is functioning, but also how government are supporting them. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, to be in a in, in a country that uh, that has done a lot in in a situation like this. A country that uh, since the first message that we heard uh, from the Crown Prince uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, telling uh, everyone, "Don't worry, uh, we are going to take care of of you guys. You have to just." Uh, stay uh, stay uh, well stay home and we are going to sort it out whether you're a businessman whether you're a part of a family whether you're an entrepreneur whether you're an sme uh, we are here to support you we are all into it and we're going to get over it very soon uh, a message like this uh, and then a stimulus pack package of 70 billion that is supporting the economy whether it's an SME or big large corporations like Emirates Airline or Etihad or Air Arabia, that for sure is a comfort that uh, that was given to the to the business community. The second thing was was that every government within the United Arab Emirates, uh, the seven governments, uh, starting from Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, Ajman, created their own incentives program to support all of the businesses uh, in within the United Arab Emirates. And that shows how we are there to support each other. Because one of the important thing is, if anything like this can happen is people losing their jobs, not finding food to eat is going to create a catastrophe for the whole economy. And when you try when you send a message that nobody can actually be fired in a situation like this, we are going through the toughest time. And I would say in, in, in humanity, we're living uh, a time where we have to sit together, uh, work together, help each other, and listen to the government. Uh, and I think a message like that was very important. So I'm very glad that uh, the number of, of, uh, of, co uh, of casualties in the Emirates has never reached to the level that they went out of control, and that shows leadership and also citizens in the UAE reacting to, to this in a very respective manner. So everybody was taking it serious. And so this always will help us from recovery plan, which, which we feel that recovery is coming. It is slower. The good thing is that the fear factor is, is reducing now. There, is a, there was a huge fear factor of what was happening around, uh, let's say, uh, Italy and what was happening in uh, America now, what we see. But the fear factor has reduced internationally, not only locally. And this is all, also a good sign uh, for, our, uh, for the whole world economy. We are going to get over it, but we are going to get over it together. What we want to see is we want to see less casualties uh, within the whole world. Uh, and I, I believe uh, the UAE had shown an amazing message by donating, supporting nations around the globe. Uh, and this is just a message that we always believe that we are 
the human human beings all around the globe are are, are the same they all deserve uh, to be supported and if we are a gateway for support from china to the world then why not let's use it to support uh, the world and support others yes yes absolutely you said something you said many things very good but especially um listen to the government is i think a, a very good sentence you said before um Maybe we could speak about it a bit later on as well, coming back to you as well later on, Alan. Thank you very much, Sofa. Stergios, how do family offices or family businesses navigate through this crisis in the region? And how do they adjust their strategies and asset allocations? Thanks, Marcus, for the question. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Marcus, uh, Anthony, and Vanessa for hosting such a great panel and be amongst uh, these distinguished panelists. Let's have, we're going to have a great discussion. To your question, right? I mean, uh, as I'm the CEO of a uh, large family office here in the Middle East, uh, the Canoe Group, that uh, we have presence in three countries and uh, business also in some in other countries, well diversified. Uh, we've been around for 130 years. So I'm sure the family over its history, right, has weathered many more crises. And uh, there are uh, two good things for family business groups. First is that they are long-term patient investors. And second, that they are quite agile and entrepreneurial to adjust or to readjust to the new reality from time to time. So what uh, we ha how we weathered, I mean, we have, uh, since also we set up Canoe Capital as the investment arm of the group, we focus a lot on the risk management. So you have to go through the cycle to make sure that you are well protected from uh, an operational direct private equity perspective first, and also that you have a multi-asset non-as correlated uh, portfolio that uh, is more liquid in order to be able to rebalance uh, across the cycle. So what we have done uh, over the past uh, few years was uh, not that we were expecting such a pandemic and uh, unprecedented crisis, but we were expecting some kind of correction so we took actually some uh, cautious uh, re readjustments on our portfolio over the past year. And uh, this uh, allowed us to be able to have uh, also cash to deploy uh, in, uh, in a case where we would see a correction. From an operational business perspective, uh, there are, of course, you know, through a pandemic, the focus is the health, most of all, for our 5,000 employees. But secondly, we need to make sure that uh, these uh, businesses have enough cash to survive. That's the first concern that we have. And we want to make sure from day one that we have all the contingency planning in place. Second is to defend your revenue base. And that's all the business models that we have in our portfolio, in our companies, to make sure that in this new environment that uh, we can defend the top line. And third, and most important, how to adopt to this new reality. So... That's what we've been doing over the past two months. That's how we're navigating through the crisis. We have priorities. Health is the most important, our people. I have to say that I work for a family, uh, but who though behave, I mean, they deal with the people like they're all a family. So we were uh, like a family of 5,000 people here, right? So every single uh, division CEO had to make sure that on their line managers, uh, what happens in Saudi, what happens in Bahrain, what happens in UAE, that they are all safe and uh, built from that bottom up. Now, how we adjust our asset allocation, I told you, I mean, we have our liquid positions where we are more capable to rebalance and to reinvest. So from equities, I mean, we're seeing some uh, great opportunities also coming up, but also we think that credit is a great asset class and I will, I will talk about it even later. So we are able to rebalance on our portfolio and tactical asset allocation to weather this uh, one or two years of uncertainty and build more illiquid strategic uh, positions from now onwards on uh, private equity and venture capital. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting. Um, Mike, given the current global environment, why is now the right time to invest in the oil business? Thank you, Marcus, and thank all of the panelists for participating today, and Sir Anthony and Vanessa for putting on the panel and uh, this virtual uh, that we can continue to do the things that we do while we're trying to stay healthy uh, and, and getting things back to normal. It was mentioned how government is participating in, in the recovery of our, 
of our of our climates and our our, our current state of the world. Uh, when it comes to the oil and gas business, that is a great thing for us who live in the U.S. because our government is so proactive. Many times when we are in a recession, and most people would call the oil and gas business right now a recession. Anytime you are in the fifteen, twenty, twenty-five dollar a barrel of oil days, you are in a recession. Most people look at that as an opportunity to get away. They are waiting for oil to go back to fifty, seventy-five hundred dollars a barrel. But when times are down, when the market is down, when the oil and gas industry is down, and we know the oil and gas industry is almost parallel to what goes on in, in the stock market. When those times are down, that's when you should be pushing harder. That's when you should be getting involved at a big time level and putting all your resources out there because just like if it's $15, $20 a barrel oil and it, and it crossed back over 20 yesterday, if oil is down, that means price is down. That means demand is down. So a person, a company, uh, those who have strategically positioned themselves for when things are, are not so great can go out and take advantage of that because you can, buy, you can buy and get involved in oil and gas at a much cheaper rate, a much cheaper price. And what I mean by that is the fact that you can go out and you can drill and you can explore and take things on to midstream and to the refinery at a better price than you can when it's 100. Everybody wants to get involved when it's 100, but typically, as we know from the history of oil and gas, that when it's 100, it typically goes down. And since the inception of, of oil and gas, we know what goes down comes up, and what goes up comes back down. So <laughs> a, 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 a company that is positioned, which uh, so many uh, uh, of us are, a company that is positioned to go out and take advantage of when times are down, that would be the reason that you would want to get involved in oil and gas at the current state of where we are. Mm -hmm. I agree, Mike. You're very right with what you said. And um, last but not least, Sydney. We spoke about new norm normality before and Michelle mentioned that as well what is the new normality what opportunities does it bring what does this bring what would you think well, first of all uh, thanks uh, thanks for having me it's an honor to be among such uh, prestigious people uh, sharing my opinions um, you're right as, as Prince Michelle said we don't really know what the new normal is um, <laughs> will there even be a new normal um, so the way we view it is firstly from a macro perspective so what we want to try and understand is um, what are the governments doing, right? And how is this sort of going to end and when is it going to end? So from our perspective, the way we're seeing it is that governments all over the world are first and foremost taking care of their people, uh, trying to flatten the curve, trying to eradicate the virus uh, and allocating as many resources as possible to actually developing uh, a vaccine. Um, you could argue some governments are doing better than others, but, but overall, I believe all the governments are, are quite sincere in this. Um, secondly, governments are doing everything they can within their power uh, to maintain the economy. So they're covering salaries, uh, they're sending people checks, uh, issuing lines of credit to, uh, to companies, uh, guaranteeing the debt market. So from our perspective, we see that we will be through this quite soon. How soon, nobody can say but we will get through this. So if we're optimistic and we know we're gonna get through it, we have to sort of think, okay, which industries are gonna be most successful once we come out? So we see it in three different ways. Um, the first is what are the pre-COVID trends uh, that were already moving forward that have just accelerated? Um, some examples of that, are, of course, work from home, which we're all doing. Uh, I mean, we're doing a conference from home right now um, uh, decentralized offices. Now, I don't think that the office will disappear. I don't think that uh, we're just going to have all decentralized companies, but there will definitely be a hybrid uh, where some people will come in to work two days a week, uh, work from home three days a week. Um, so there will be a lot of opportunities in that space, uh, which we're already seeing if you look at, you know, stocks like Zoom, uh, if you look at Microsoft, um, companies that are well positioned in this space, that they're already doing quite well. Uh, on demand entertainment, uh, food and grocery delivery. I mean, I don't think anyone uh, is going to go back to shopping in supermarkets. I'm certainly not. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing just having stuff delivered to your house. Um, I think localized manufacturing is going to become really important. I think a lot of governments have realized 
how dependent we are for those essential items, um, not just food, but also medicine, uh, building materials. Um, we, we've sort of made the, the Far East uh, the manufacturing of the world. And it, it's quite apparent now that those supply chains are very fragile. So I do believe that there's going to be a trend towards uh, localized manufacturing. And definitely retail is going to be dead for a while. Uh, the second way we look at things is what are the new emerging trends which are overhyped? So everyone is piling onto homeschooling at the moment. Um, I think that's very overhyped. Um, I don't know how many of you are actually doing homeschooling at the moment, but believe me, I can't wait to send my kids back to school. Um, but this is for I, another. I <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> this is for another reason. <laughs> Well, not, not just that. I mean, um, there's a social component. There's many components. Uh, I would say probably universities, you know, universities will still be there. There will be a bigger market opportunity maybe for a home uh, university or distance learning university. Um, there's overinvestment right now in PPE production, which I think is overhyped. Uh, that's definitely going to come down. And then the third way we look at things is, okay, what has sort of stopped and is going to come back in a big way? So think about holidays, experiences, flights, taxis. So in that space, we're sort of looking for undervalued companies um, where we could use our capital to, to prop them up for now um, and, and hopefully help them get through this tough period and come out stronger than ever uh, when demand picks back up. Um, so, so that's what I think the new normal is going to look like. But as Prince Michel rightly said, who knows? <laughs> um. I think nobody really knows, but one thing for sure, I know already now, this is probably the most efficient conference I've ever been in my life. <laughs> no flights, 100%. no sales, no traveling, no suitcase, no this and that. I mean, it's fantastic. And you get all the input you want, right? So to be efficient, um, I would like to start the second round of um, questions. Um, I would just kindly ask you for a little bit shorter um, answers. You know, timing um, is a bit uh, important for me and timing is not a town in China. So if we could get it a little bit uh, shorter, then I would like to start with my friend Michelle again with the question, what can we really do to protect ourselves so people who are important to us or our employees or our businesses, if that happens again? You know, it, uh, when we saw what, what, what government did, and um, uh, I'm very happy as, as I'm Austrian, that because the Austrian government, I think, did a very good job in this, but there, there are other countries which didn't perform so well, other governments which didn't perform so well. So what would you think? could we do to prepare if something like this comes again? Um, yes, Marcus. Uh, and the word you use is prepare. Uh, I think we live thinking that we are here forever, that nothing can happen to us as a human being, that we are <laughs> invulnerable and no disease can come to us and nothing can stop us. And then a tiny, my, tiny, tiny little minute Microb, microbic uh, disease arrives and look where we are. So as you say, prepare. I think it uh, involves a few things. You have to be first use your brain a little bit. Remember that bad things can happen. You don't want them to happen, but they can happen and have a minimum of preparation, whether it is Uh, backup plans uh, for contingency plans for it can start from home uh, if you have a problem at home you have to have another place where you can go with your family if you have a problem at your office you have to have also an alternative uh, teleworking of course helps uh, it's like you I remember we used to have uh, in the photography area we would take backups of every photography put them on hard disks And you would put a hard disk at home, a hard disk in your office, a hard disk somewhere else in the country. So in case of fire, you can recuperate your data. Uh, I think you have to do the same. We, what I realize here, I mean, it's amazing to imagine that from one day to another, you could not find a mask. You could not find sanitizing gel because, as Sydney was saying, there were built in other countries that because of the, the restrictions on their own could not send to us. So I, I would definitely check to see what's in your neighborhood. What, and then also 
very important is the, the connection in the community, which I think has been lost. And I've seen now, I don't know how it happens in, in where you are, but every day at eight o'clock, everybody goes on their balconies to cheer, uh, to thank for the, for the medical personnel. And people meet. And suddenly I, I met some neighbors, which I had no idea were there. And then you meet in the street and then people are not scared to say hello because that's what it came down to. People are embarrassed to talk to people they don't know. So I think when, when, when the community, community gets together, um, it, it can help. And mm -hmm. basically caring is sharing. And I hope uh, I don't take too much time, Marcos. No, perfect. It was uh, interesting and definitely not a wasted time. However, Nuf, a little yes. bit less than two minutes, please. Um, sure. What I would like to ask you is, what would you see is the role of private wealth investments supporting government climate changes initiatives? Um, let me tell you about our experience. Uh, we are in the healthcare and uh, food uh, sector. So we see ourselves as, a, actually we were surprised that we are uh, one of the few players in Saudi Arabia uh, who were uh, supporting the government in, in this pandemic. Uh, we, we, I think the government are now realized that we need to push uh, the boundaries and we need to uh, allocate more capital to the, uh, to the food securities, as Sidney said, and drug securities, uh, and have it manufactured locally. Uh, uh, as a private uh, wealth, there is a report from Credit Suisse, I have looked at it yesterday, that the amount of wealth accounted for private sector is around 360 trillion, which is four times uh, the, the global GDP. It's not a small amount, while also it's, it's a multiple amount of money of the stimulus being, being proposed by the government. So this money should be also support our government, support our economy, because it should go hand in hand. At the end of the day, it's impact our lives and our children. Well, absolutely. Um, again, a subject that we could speak probably much longer about and uh, would be very, very interesting. But um, I would like to ask uh, Hermann again now, what type of investments may attract even more attention in these times now or even beyond? What would you think, Hermann? Well, thank you. And uh, certainly very enjoyable hearing all the, the comments and um, very interesting learning a lot. And I like also what Stereo said concerning his family that he works with and how they've been around for over 100 years. I'm with the Royal Bank of Canada. And we've also been around uh, over 150 years. And, and the way we've been able to stay around is really by thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. And by thinking ahead, we've been able to stay ahead. And it hasn't just been a strong balance sheet and, and capital and, and you know, paying dividends and, and the, sort of the numbers. Everyone can scrub the numbers and see what a company is worth. But it's, it's how we've given back to the community. It's how we've given back to our employees. And... And that's a theme we've been looking at in, in investing as well. And that's the, f the famous ESG, Environment Social Governance. It's that acronym that has become popular, something we've been looking at for probably the past 10 years when looking at companies. And, and we often say it's not everything that counts can be counted. So a balance sheet is one thing and we can look at the numbers, but it's really figuring out what is the corporate culture. And I, and I believe that when we leave this, this very difficult time, companies will be remembered by how they treated their employees, how they treated the communities where they worked, what contingency plans they had in place, what health and safety standards, how they trained their employees. And that's the S in the ESG. We talked a lot about the E going into this, um, this very difficult time and how we treated the environment, which is so important, and, and the culture of companies um, not littering and not polluting and, and again, trying to figure out what that looked like. But today the S has become so important. And so for us, um, ensuring that when we look at companies and the competitive dynamics of those companies, um, it's one thing to have a company that's growing its earnings. That's important. Growing market share. That's important. Being in a growing end market. That's obviously important. But ESG is something that will be a big focus. And um, the market's already paying for that. We've seen companies that have high ESG scores, if you want to call them that, or that have behaved properly, um, have actually benefited and have gone down a bit less. And, and we believe that's really a long-term theme that's not mm -hmm. going to be more important than ever. 
absolutely, absolutely. Um, I wish somebody would say something I, I can't agree with, so I could at least uh, uh, argue with you, gentlemen, a bit. But so far, um, uh, really, very good, very happy. Marvan, what has Sharuk done to support his businesses and projects and partners during the outbreak of the COVID-19? Uh, maybe we'll start by just giving a, um, a short brief about what we do. So Sharuk is an investment and a development uh, authority for the government of Sharjah where it is uh, mandated to uh, support investors, uh, develop uh, opportunities, come up with data-driven analysis, and uh, uh, assess uh, all of the projects and sectors that are requiring uh, F FDI, foreign direct investments. And on the other hand, developing projects. So developing projects in different sectors, whether it's tourism-related, real estate, recycling, agriculture, hospitality, healthcare. And so in the, in the past uh, decade, uh, since inception of Shuruq in, in 2009, we have developed uh, a vast majority of projects focused mainly on tourism, which is basically extremely affected, I would say, at the time being in this uh, COVID-19. However, our portfolio is diversified, but this COVID-19 gave us uh, a thought about looking at new sectors, uh, whether it's vertical farming, whether it's telemedicine, whether it's logistics, but uh, using drone system rather than the usual. Uh, and this is what we do in, in Shuruq. We guide investors. We try to support them by giving them information. But the world is changing so fast that sometimes you provide information that gets outdated by the time you publish them. So we have to be so advanced and coming up with looking at, uh, if the world is going uh, to look uh, as how we see it today, then there are new sectors that, uh, that we need to look into it. And, and this is something that Shuruq does. So on the other hand, we actually support uh, investors here in, in Shuruq uh, in many different ways, not financially mainly, but uh, most importantly in, in, in identifying what are, what are the gaps in, in the current industry. Mm -mm. Well, thank you very much. Again, uh, a subject we could speak about for a while and, and very interesting. And I think we spoke about it already a couple of years ago when we met first. Um, but um, unfortunately, we don't have so much time. So again, gentlemen, please, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, because I don't see you. No? So uh, a bit less than two minutes, please, if possible. Um, Dergios, um, what would be the role of technology and innovation um, post our uh, COVID period? What would you think? And please, a bit less than two minutes, if you could. Yeah, sure. I think it's going to be very critical. I mean, technology so far has been uh, utilized uh, at a certain level, but to me, underutilized, even for the simplest thing. We had Microsoft Teams or Zoom in the office, but we never used it. Now we used it. So that's emerging trends, right? So, I mean, we'll, so we appreciate uh, the use of the tool. So technology is a tool that we can use it to be more efficient on our uh, you know, business, on our uh, communications, on everything. So I think we're moving more now, that's the emerging trend of physical localization, but we're talking about uh, more uh, virtual globalization. And what do I mean by that is that uh, vital sectors from food, energy, water, healthcare, education, right? So we have very, very important tools here to utilize in order to become better human beings uh, to manage our time more efficiently. I used to travel like crazy, right? And Anthony knows that. So I'm not going to travel as much now anymore, to be honest, because also that's not the expectation of the other party. We're going to use technology. So this time I'm going to save time. This way I'm going to save time in order to utilize it elsewhere. So I hope, that's my hope, that using uh, innovation and technology will become more efficient from a business perspective and from a human perspective uh, going forward. Also that uh, well-being right? I will be driven by that. I'm talking about energy efficiency. I'm a big fan of climate change, which becomes to me a major risk driver in any business. And we need to uh, also take it into consideration. And we are, if I talk for the family, we are an industrial group, so we can still use technology for the digital transformation of uh, very critical industrial uh, sectors, besides the vital sectors that I just mentioned. So it's going to be very critical. And we have to use it more. Exactly. So you would agree with me that it's, a, uh, if not the most, at least a very efficient conference, what we're doing here right now, correct? Of course. <laughs> but we need to meet also I mean, eh, at some point, Mark. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Um, Mike, back to you. Um, why do actually oil prices always go up? The, the simple answer, 
Marcus, in, in, in a, in a two-minute answer is demand. You think about the fact that since for the last 120 years, oil and gas has been in demand since we've discovered it. And we have tried many, many times over the last 75 years, especially going all the way back to the 1950s, to replace petroleum. Uh, going all the way back to when Walt Disney invented the monorail system. And that was going to be our future way of transportation. And we were no longer going to need gas to put into our vehicles. And here we are 70 plus years later, and the demand for petroleum is higher than ever. We know how many things that we get to utilize on a daily basis that have petroleum in it, from, from makeup to pins and right on down, down the line. There are many refineries around the world that do not even produce gas that goes into vehicles. No gas, no diesel. All the other products that are involved mm -hmm. in oil and gas. So the main reason uh, that prices always go up is because there's always a demand. Things mm -hmm. such as uh, the, the, the government having a, a negative comment or, or the, the, the news media saying things. A refinery gets shut down in some part of the world and our supply supposedly goes down the price goes down. But then tomorrow, just like with food, everybody has to eat and everybody will need petroleum at some point in the near future, if not today. And demand mm -hmm. determines the price goes back up. Mm -mm. Sounds very logic to me. Even I would understand. Sydney, back to you again. Um, distressed assets are a huge opportunity. But how do you value them correctly and avoid to catch a falling knife? Okay, I'm going to attempt to do this in under two minutes. Um, so I, I would say probably the, the, the most important thing right now to consider with distressed assets is valuation and timing. So valuation is especially hard that we've even had to come up with a new acronym, which is EBITDAC, which is earnings before income taxes, depreciation, amortization, and corona, uh, which means to say <laughs> that those are all kind of worthless right now, right? Um, someone's sales in 2019 don't really mean anything. Um, the asset valuations on a balance sheet don't really mean anything. So we need to really try and value the company as what do we think the cash flows that they will generate post Corona. Uh, the second challenge uh, is timing. So, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. When do we think that this will really be over? Right? So the timing is important because if you buy a distressed asset just by magically buying it, it doesn't become non-distressed. Mm -hmm. So it still needs cash and cash flows. So we need to time them in such a proper manner that um, they're well-funded until we think things are going to pick up again. So I would say those are the two things that I would look out for uh, when looking at distressed assets. Michel, you mentioned before destroying to grow. Now, what are the top lessons we learned from this, um, from this dramatic episode, from this period, from this time? What did, what did we learn? Um, I think it's a bit early to say what we learned. Um, I would say, if you look at the importance of the network, of the community, uh, staying home has been very important to realize that many, many times we give preference to what's happening far away, or we don't even, sorry, I shouldn't say that we don't give preference, but we know something is happening far away, we don't know, but we don't even know what's happening in our own backyard. Um, I've been impressed by people, you know, because they are staying here, they tell me, it's amazing. I didn't know this street existed. It's amazing. I didn't know such and such places were here. Um, I've been uh, all my life living in Monaco. I never spent so much time in Monaco and, and, and things like that. And then when I speak with business people, they tell me, it's incredible. We, we don't have spare parts. It's amazing. We, we're running out of supplies. Uh, we can't get anything. We were relying on the exterior. Um, so I think one les lesson I would probably use for me is to the integration of what's happening and uh, putting everything in balance. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's, it's fantastic to be able to travel. And that's something I, I miss. And I, I believe social 
contact is very important. I mean, it's wonderful to be like we are today on Zoom. Uh, two months ago, I never heard of the word Zoom. I didn't know what it was. And I'm sure, I don't know how many of you used it before. I, I never did. And I can see how, how useful it is because really we can connect right away and, you know, on our different timetables and we don't have jet lag. We don't have to lose our suitcase at the airport and we arrive with no clothes at the conference. And, I mean, things like that. Of course, the human connection is missing, that's for sure. But I think the, the important thing is, is to take care of your people in your, in your own garden, but not to close yourself to what's happening around. Uh, we've seen a few governments in Europe who, first of all, they didn't act together. So everyone went with their own law, whether it was detrimental to the neighbor, they didn't care. And I think that's a pity. Uh, to work together is far more important. Mm. Yes, agreed. Uh, because the virus doesn't know any frontiers, no, as we as we know. But I was surprised that you said you have never heard about the word Zoom because I thought you're a photographer. Okay, that's another subject. No, uh, I still <laughs> I still uh, cannot see you. But um, let me ask you, mm. how to uh, positioning for the future? What would you think? Uh, in terms of investment, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, from the financial assets uh, perspective, I think most of the family office they have now uh, they have to rebalance their portfolio to uh, go back to the strategic asset allocation that they have in place. I don't think it's a good idea now to uh, do a major shift uh, within uh, uh, the next two months. Um, uh, you know, stick to inflation hedge, uh, equity is the best inflation hedge assets, and of course, gold. That's my advice. Mm -hmm. hmm. Herman, um, I would like to ask you the, a bit the same question as Michelle. What, what do you think do we, do we learn or did we learn or will we learn from, from what's, what's happening? You have to unmute. I think it would help us. I just said the most important things I was going to say, and I was on mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we've, we've learned a lot, and, and again, there's so much we don't know. Um, but I, I think we've learned that um, coming out of this will be more like a, a marathon, not a sprint. And it won't be just turning the light switch back on, but it'll be a little bit like a dimmer. It'll take some time um, for things to maybe become what will be perceived as a new normal. And we're seeing that already you know, in China, where People are going back to work, but they're not necessarily going out on weekends. Um, there's uh, less um, time being spent at movie theaters. Um, there'll be more cuddling on the couch and less, uh, less going to the movie theater. There'll be perhaps more ordering in and, and eating leftovers and going to restaurants as people try to figure out where the safety element is. But I will say that we've, we've learned really to stay the course. And I think that's so important mm -hmm. with, um, with everything you know, we do with investing for our clients and for our families, um, very often when there's um, very, lots of excitement in the market, there's this momentum of optimism. And, and when markets correct, there's a momentum of fear. And sometimes we react at the wrong time and change the course. And, and, and what's really important, what we're continuing to learn is to stay focused, um, to recognize that markets always revert back to a mean, you get exaggerations. Um, but likely, as we look out over the next few years, um, all of this, you know, very difficult time and period um, will have uh, will have resolved itself. We will act differently in an elevator. We perhaps won't be the same in our office. There won't be as much um, people mm -hmm. fluttering around each other. But um, I think we've learned to uh, to be helpful, to be kind, to think of others, um, but also to stay the course. Mm -hmm. Marvin. Um, how much of the economy uh, in the UAE has changed and what to expect in the post-COVID-19 area? Well, I, th I think, you know, UAE is, a, is one of the countries that have uh, created a, uh, a strategy to, to let go of oil in a sense that not depending on oil as a main thing compared to 19, I would say, 80. Uh, today, it's way much diversified. However, the post-COVID-19 uh, is going to be totally different. I think the focus on healthcare is something that the government has, has shown, show, showcased uh, uh, dramatically in this, in, this, in this period. It also has a huge focus on food security, but in a different way. Before, uh, before uh, 
pre-COVID-19, when, when countries were talking about uh, food security, they were talking about uh, investing in different countries. But with the, with the COVID, even airports were closed. Uh, ships were not uh, sailing as they used to sail. And every, the disruption happened to everything. So you have to depend mm -hmm. on yourself. And I think what we have learned is that uh, with technology, you can, you can basically do a lot with, with much less space. Uh, the other thing I, I think, you know, we were always talking about the fourth industrial revolution and how it will impact the economy. I think COVID-19 mm -hmm. have accelerated that to a, to a different level, that we are going to accept things that we never expect, accepted it at the beginning. Uh, I mean, two months ago, they were, we were talking about dreams, about picking stuff through a drone, and today we're seeing it happening, uh, seeing it, seeing it happening uh, in the Emirates. Uh, and, and I think this thing is all, all, always helpful for us. Uh, and I think you, uh, the, the, the point is we have to be prepared for that change. And sometimes mm -hmm. the situation makes us change faster than we ever ex ex expected it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Absolutely. Sergios, what are the few sectors and asset classes that will be in the focus over the next, let's say, one to two years? What would you think? So, I mean, uh, talking about uh, short term on uh, the liquid side, we like credit. Uh, that's on our uh, tactical asset allocation. But when it comes to more strategic and illiquid uh, positioning, uh, we do like growth private equity and venture capital, but more thematic, uh, more thematically where we can add value. So that's why I was talking about sustainability. Sustainability is not just a word. And that was proven also through the, through the crisis that we're going now. If you see all uh, the stocks uh, with an ES ESG perspective, as, uh, as Prince Herman mentioned, they outperformed all the other stocks. So sustainability is there from a financing perspective as a key theme that we like. And we're talking about not only renewables, but we're talking about waste management, we're talking about uh, energy efficiency and also water preservation. When it comes to food, I agree with uh, my co-panelists. I mean, food security is critical. We are uh, building up in terms of, uh, will be eight to nine billion in a few decades. And, uh, there will not be enough food. Climate change comes to play into this. And uh, in order to avoid, you know, with all huge uh, unemployment, mass unemployment coming, which is happening now, right? If we want to avoid social unrest here, we need to create jobs. How do you create jobs? You need to support the SMEs, the new SMEs in every single country. That's why the government with the private sector have to get together and support efficient business models from existing SMEs or from new startups. So we as a group, right, we look at it very strategically, also from a finance perspective and investment perspective. So these are the areas. For the overall new era that we're getting in, we need cybersecurity. Uh, mm -hmm. If we, because now we're moving more to the digital world, so cybersecurity is another key sector for us, uh, and especially cybersecurity as a service. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go a little bit away for a second for, from from the from the virus, Mike and. What are the key components in recognizing, evaluating, evaluating, and taking action in identifying solid investment opportunities during the global climate right now? Well, Marcus, I think it's number one, like it is with many times when you get involved in investments, is knowing who you're getting in business with. Does the, is the company solid? Is there, is there foundation there? Uh, do they have a proven track record? Uh, is there is their foundation been laid to handle uh, the staying power of when difficult times come our way? I don't think that you ever necessarily get involved in an oil and gas business or a real estate business or any sort of fashion. You get involved with the individuals who are running the company. And I think that's why we see many every day uh, in, in the business sector of CEOs being put on TV and promoting the business that they're involved in. And when you look at his or his or her on, on, on online, or you look at them on the, on the MSNBC, do you feel the trust and the honesty and integrity of that individual? And do your business philosophies align with what they are saying and promoting within their company? <laughs> Again, I would like to say a lot now, but uh, um, we'll have the chance, I hope, uh, soon uh, when we meet in person. Um, Sydney. How can we adjust existing portfolios and assets in general to maximize 
value. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip portfolios. I think um, the esteemed panel has, uh, has talked <laughs> a lot you. about portfolios and I'll talk about uh, the, the existing assets that we, for example, have. I think the best way to maximize value right now is to continue to invest in your businesses and invest in your people. Um, you know, what we've come to realize in this whole thing is that uh, money doesn't build or break businesses. Uh, people do, right? Um, and, and certainly it's been our people who have helped our businesses grow. So now in this time of crisis, we have to support them as well. Um, it, it's easy to make an excuse and arbitrarily start to fire people and let people go and look at the bottom line. But I think that if you can just get through this, uh, keeping your people, keeping them happy, I think that coming out of it, you're going to have an organization that is devoted to making you the most successful company there is. So I think right now, if you want to maximize your assets, invest in your people. Well, thank you very much, Sydney. Thank you very much to all of my panelists. It was really interesting. I was excited and, as I said, most efficient. We learned a lot um, today and uh, we could talk about all for, for really for a while. Nevertheless, I'm really looking forward to seeing you um, in Monaco, uh, hopefully soon for the next, uh, for the next uh, summit. And I would like to um, uh, have some uh, questions from, from the audience now. Um, for example, there's one question which comes from Anonymous Zuschauer, which means like anonymous uh, guest, how the economy will look after uh, COVID-19 and what's the uh, best advice to invest? We had this question of already uh, answered. I believe it was um, uh, from, from Sydney as well. But um, how would you see that uh, stereos maybe from, from your point of view? You have to unmute. What was the question again? Sorry, Marcus. The question was, uh, what would be the best um, investment advice after this period, whenever that might finish, uh, whenever we could say that it's finished, because I think it will have an impact on our lives for a very long time and we will not have the same life as before. But the question from, from Anonyma Zuschauer was asked, what is the best investment advice after this, after this time? On top of what uh, Sydney said, invest in uh, yes. good yes. people, I would say you know, invest in sustainable business models. Don't invest in hypes. So I believe a lot on creation, no disruption. Mm -hmm. We were always mm -hmm. looking about something disruptive mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we were never expecting uh, several uh, scenarios, like extreme scenarios like the pandemic. So always mm -hmm. develop sustainable business models with very strong risk management uh, you know, function within it and all the scenario that you can run mm -hmm. in order to uh, maximize return and minimize the risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here comes an interesting question as well from um, Mark Harris. He said, um, with the current new business, uh, has food security become an attractive investment? Marvin, you maybe, I, I see you already uh, daring to, uh, yep. I, I uh, dying to answer the question. I did mention it, yeah, that food security is definitely going to be something that uh, many governments, I would say in the GCC that are depending a lot of imports, are going to jump into it because it's a huge uh, money-making business. Here in Sharjah, we have an exciting company called Vegitech, which actually does uh, vertical farm farming using hydroponics and use it without using pesticides, and their return of investment is extremely high. And, and I've seen a lot of... Uh, Industries uh, when it comes to ver uh, when it comes to food security is thriving now. So I think it's it's a good sector to invest in, which is they call it like uh, farm to mm -hmm. farm to table or, or food to table, something like that. Uh, a term that is used, uh, which mm -hmm. I believe is a great sector to 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 study it. We definitely mm -hmm. in Shuru are, are jumping into that sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here is a very long question um, from somebody else as well. Um, it's around the lines. How will the deal flow for family office change in the future since you cannot or you will not or you might not want to meet so much so close anymore in the future? How, how would you see uh, the deal flows uh, that the, the club is among family office members would, would change in the future? Who would, who would like to go on this one? Herman, maybe with your banking background. Herman? Seems like Herman has 
left us, or at least the connection is not that great anymore. Well, if you want, I would uh, tell you my opinion about this question, because I think it's for family office, a very um, interesting question. I think um, the deal flow would, uh, would not significantly change um, now, because whatever the future will bring, the, 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 the deal flow among family offices is based a lot on trust. And I think that um, rather sooner than later, we would uh, try maybe not uh, to live a life as we had before, being with many people as close as possible as many times, but the people we, we, we like, we know, we trust, and from one family office to, to another, very often there is a lot of uh, uh, trust, there's a lot of knowing each other. And um, I think that there will not be a significant change in deal flows um, uh, after um, a certain period of time when we get a bit back to this um, before mentioned normal uh, and new normality. Yaman, are you back with us? It doesn't seem like it. Okay. Um, any other questions uh, from, from the audience here? We have lots of questions here. Most of them we answered already. It's, it's all around, the, or many I can see now is around the lines. Um, what will be different after this period? How would the time look after that? Um, uh, which sectors should we invest? I mean, we've discussed it a lot. So um, there's an interesting question. Vanessa, please. So sorry, um, Marcus. I think there's an interesting question for Nuf specifically, question number 13, uh, which is, do you want to read it or? Go ahead, no, go ahead. Until yeah. I find it, you're faster. <laughs> so, we have so uh, many questions you have to know. And really lots of questions here, thank God. But um, yeah. I think you're faster by reading it straight out. So Nuf, um, if you're there, we'd love to, so the question is, interesting to hear that you will increase your allocation to gold are you also allocating some money to digital gold bitcoin are you considering gold as collateral for a flat loan mm. and profit from low almost a zero interest rate uh, actually we have increased our allocation to gold whether it's uh, digital or etf or physical gold uh, to use it as a collateral, we are not at that stage yet. Uh, we are buying gold because it's an inflation hedge uh, and make a balance for our uh, investment portfolio. That's only the reason. It's not for collateral or against loan. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not at that stage yet. Uh, uh, but gold is uh, mainly uh, known for inflation hedge since decade. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, so another question here, which is um, around um, technology as such. Um, that's why the question here, we had um, for the last uh, two years, especially in the last year, we had a lot the subject of artificial intelligence in investment management. As, uh, as you might know, um, myself, we have, we have acquired an, an asset manager, which is doing asset management based only on artificial intelligence. How do you think that this part of technology will influence our lives under the light of the new normality? What, what, what would you think? How would that influence us and how would it change? So, sorry, do you mean artificial intelligence in general or specifically in investing? In investing, in the investment process. In investing. So, so one of the challenges with, with any sort of artificial intelligence, uh, which is more or less just you know, a collection of algorithms, is they use the past to really make judgments about the future, right? So I think right now, especially given what we've been saying the whole time, the new normal, the new normal, the new normal, mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that those algorithms are not really well suited uh, to making the right kind of judgments, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because the past is not necessarily going to inform our future anymore. So, so I would be very careful to, to let, um, let's say, an AI really make those kind of judgments without someone really supervising and making sure that it's not using past data uh, to inform a future which is just completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But yes, again, another subject which I would love to speak about for a while. As I said, you know, we, we've invested in an asset manager who is doing asset management based only on artificial intelligence, but um, the time is a bit short. Um, I, I, another question came up. Um, Investing in art uh, was always, you know, a subject in, in the past. 
will that um, be different in the future? Will it be more interesting? Will it be less interesting? What do you think, Michel? Let me ask you this question, knowing that you're a famous photographer. You have to unmute first, please. There we are. Okay, sorry. Here we are. Thank you for this kind compliment. Uh, I've seen, indeed, a lot of people I've been talking to uh, going into art. Uh, at least pre-COVID, I saw a lot of new art fans. There always has been art fans for the last 30, 40 years. They never have really, really developed. It was always a problem of liquidity. Uh, I think art, like real estate, is uh, slow to move. And if you need your cash right away, uh, you, it's not going to be that easy. It's not a commodity you can exchange instantly on the markets. But some paintings have been uh, going up in value, some photographs also. Um, paintings have a life which is much longer than photography. Photos normally stay for 60 years or 70 years. I mean, we've had some photos who have been 100 years old, but we haven't seen anything more. Whereas if you take a painting or art, you have art which is thousands of years old and is still there today. So it's going to be interesting to see how photography would insert itself into the art. Um, there is, of course, a market for that is growing. You see a lot of uh, uh, setting up in different places, tax-free ports with art. You see a lot of banks that offer art advisory, a lot of companies like, you know, the big auction houses, they also are, offer advisory. And uh, you used to have people who bought just for the aesthetics. And now you have the people who buy just for the business. So there is an evolution there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I was scrolling a little bit uh, through the other questions. And I think, Vanessa, we have uh, covered most of the questions, uh, more or less with, with our session before uh, and the questions after. Um, and I've seen also we got a lot of compliments for our session we did for our event. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for that. It was really nice. Vanessa, if you have some other questions you found, which I didn't see, which you want to ask, then please go ahead. Yeah, there's just, I would say, maybe one question, one last question for Michael, Michael Wright. Um, this is on behalf of Miriam Mufida Abdelkrim. Sorry, Miriam, if I didn't say your name right. So the question is, um, during this unprecedented energy crisis, why haven't the oil and gas companies invested more heavily into, into renewable energies? I am in a way to, to energy creation coupled with solar mini grids. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering well, what Michael Wright thinks about this. Um, I, I, I believe that the research and stuff that the big oil and gas companies have, have done, and they've done a lot of research and they have a lot of development going on. I think a lot of those companies have things that they have not brought to the marketplace yet because they have just not been ready. In my particular instance, um, my daughter, who's a board member with our company, is, is major on going green, which is uh, a, a totally different philosophy sometimes with the oil and gas business. That being said, uh, we continue to work on those things on a daily basis. Uh, programs are being put in place. Uh, for the most part, I, I do believe that the, 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 big, the big oil and gas companies, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world, are focusing on this area and they are trying to get more energy efficient. Solar panels are popping up left and right. I know in the United States, uh, I think it's just a little premature, not in the fact that we don't need it today, just in the research and the, and, and the technology and the approach that is going to be made. I think we're just a little premature on that. I, Vanessa, if I may, um, I've seen another question, which we have already received before our um, virtual keynote panel which I think is a, is a very nice final question to ask, which I would like to ask Herman. What does it mean to be noble in the 21st century under these given circumstances? Oh my goodness. <laughs> a, a wonderful question as I sit in Toronto, Canada with the temperature going down to minus one tomorrow. 
So that's maybe a little bit of the background. Um, I've always said that there's a great responsibility as um, all of our family knows. Um, and that is really to recognize that we are no different than anybody, clearly. Um, we may have a history that goes back, like so many of us uh, all have a long history and a wonderful story to tell. And, and some families have a story that is better known. But um, being noble, I think today is, is really recognizing that, um, you know, we have to uh, give back even perhaps more than, than some others have to in terms of just what we, we, we want to be um, recognized for. And, uh, but it's really being humble, um, you know, being, being kind and, uh, you know, being um, grateful for what we have and, and, and the history that we have as a family. But there's really nothing today that, uh, that should differentiate us. And, and this COVID-19 is really the great reset. Um, and it's a great reminder that, you know, we're all in this together and uh, we are all going to get out of this together as well. Well, thank you very much, Herman. Thank you to all of you. It was really a pleasure. We got lots of compliments on our remarks on the chat. So um, it's thanks to you. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that I uh, could do this with you together. I'm looking forward to see you all very soon, hopefully here in Monaco. And um, please stay in Dutch. And most of all, stay well. Thank, thank you. you. So, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank Marcus. You. It was a pleasure. And thank Thanks. you very much, all of you. It was a great honor for me to be the patron of this uh, conference. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody, not only us on the, on the panel, but all the listeners to, to get together and to reinforce uh, what, uh, what I call this great community of uh, friends of Sir Anthony Ritosa. Uh, thanks to you, you have been creating since uh, five, six years now a wonderful movement that's been growing and growing. And it's getting more and more interesting every year. There's deep uh, relations that are being created between all the members. And I'm happy to see that uh, it's not a virus that's going to stop that. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michel. Thank you as well, Prince Michel. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, just wanted to thank uh, so um, our chairman uh, Marcus Lenner for for taking care of this wonderful virtual keynote panel. Sir Anthony, thank you so much for hosting the most exceptional panels as well as global conferences around the world. Everyone knows that uh, we're all looking forward to welcoming you in Monaco very soon, hopefully end of July. And then please note that we have our uh, October conference in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, um, on the 7th, uh, on the 5th to 7th of October, followed by Dubai in December, and, uh, the 7th uh, to the 9th of December. So if you have any questions, please contact us, and we're looking forward to welcoming you very soon. And last thing, our next virtual panel will be on the 15th of May. So please email us if you want to visit this. Thank you.